Good morning and welcome to the Allen Press webinar, Managing Authorship and Copyright Agreements. I'm Joanna Gillette, Product Marketing Manager at Allen Press, and I'll be your host today. On your screen, you should see some general information about participating in today's webinar. I'm going to go over a few of these items very quickly before we get started. Our presenters will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, so if you do have questions, please use the chat function of WebEx to direct questions to the webinar host, which is me. You can do this at any time during the presentation. We're using VoiceOver IP technology to broadcast the audio for today's webinar, so please make sure you have the volume turned up on your PC if you're having trouble hearing. VoiceOver IP quality may vary depending on network traffic today. So if you are having trouble hearing, you can always call in to listen to the webinar over our conference line instead. The toll-free telephone number and participant passcode for the conference line are listed next to the green telephone icon on this slide. If you do call into the conference line, please be sure to mute your telephone. You can continue the conversation with us and your fellow attendees after the webinar using the discussions tab of the Allen Press Facebook page. Here you can post a comment, share an idea, or ask a question. And of course, we also encourage attendees to tweet during and after the event, and you can use the hashtag ACWeb28. Today, Mary Riley and Nicole Richter will share best practices for navigating the complex matters of authorship, copyright, and licensing. Mary Riley is the Manager of Publishing Services at Allen Press. She's been with Allen Press for seven years, and during that time, she's worked in various positions in the publishing department, including licensing manager as well as publisher. Nicole Richter served as publishing specialist to several Allen Press publishing clients. Before joining Allen Press, Nicole held positions in education administration. Most recently, she worked at the University of Kansas as a senior administrative associate for the KU Honors Program. She also volunteers at the National Archives in Kansas City, Missouri in its preservation program. Nicole holds a master's degree in library science from Emporia State University, a master's degree in European studies from the University of Westminster, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in U.S. History from the University of Kansas. All right, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our presenters now, and don't forget to send me your questions if you have them. Thank you, Joanna. Today, Mary and I are going to walk through the steps of publication with you and present some best practices and resources along the way to help you navigate authorship and copyright. Mary will get us started with types of authorship. Thank you, Nicole. There are a few different types of authorship that I want to describe to help us understand the journey of an article with regards to copyright and authorship. The first I want to review is the author. As stated in copyright law, an author is the creator of the original expression of a work. The author is also the owner of the copyright unless there is a written agreement by which the author assigns the copyright to another person or entity. The next is a contributing author. This is the author that typically only contributes for specific topics, data, or content, and a contributor normally doesn't write the final work. A contributor is not generally the author that holds the copyright or assigns the copyright. And lastly, work for hire. Even though the person who creates the work is usually the owner of the copyright, there is an exception, work for hire. Work for hire is when the work is prepared by an employee within the scope of his or her employment or work specifically ordered or commissioned. And to be more specific with regards to government employees, a work of the United States government is a work prepared by an officer or an employee of the United States government as part of that person's official duties. So those are the main types of authors that we will discuss during this webinar. Nicole will now discuss funding sources for authors. So funding agencies can have a significant impact on research and scholarly publishing. Agencies are frequently a contributing factor when it comes to determining what is researched and how it's published. Most co funding comes from corporate or government organizations. Corporate funding is usually allocated to the research and development or R&D department. While results may benefit the wider public, it's usually motivated by profit. Think of companies such as IBM or Johnson & Johnson. If research is not being funded by a private company or corporation, it's usually being funded by a government grant. 
The two main government organizations that award grants are the NSF and NIH. NSF stands for the National Science Foundation. They award grants for science and engineering at all educational levels, typically for a three-year term. They approve about 28% of all applications that they receive. The total amount of funding is approximately $6.9 billion, or 11,500 new awards each year. This means that 20% of all federally supported basic research conducted at colleges and universities comes from NSF grants. The other organization is NIH. NIH stands for the National Institutes of Health. They award grants for the advancement of health and medicine for career development, so new investigators. Award terms are typically three to five years. They approve 21% of applications, so that's about 7% less than the NSF. Their total funding is about $31.2 billion, or 57,500 new awards each year. This is significantly more total funding and awards than the NSF. There is some overlap between NSF and NIH in the fields of biology, chemistry, nanotechnology, and material science. Only new investigators without previous federal funding may apply for both the NIH and NSF grants. As I mentioned before, funding agencies can have an impact on how an article is published. One recent impactful example is the OSTP memo. OSTP stands for Office of Science and Technology Policy. The memo states that federal agencies investing in research more than $100 million in annual expenditures must have a clear and coordinated policy for increasing public access. As I mentioned before, the NSF gives about $6.9 billion in funding and NIH about $31.2 billion. So this mandate applies to both funding agencies. In addition to U.S. funding agencies, you may also encounter international agencies. One example is the Research Councils UK or RCUK. RCUK invests about $3 billion in public money in research in the UK each year. They award grants to the full spectrum of academic disciplines. They work in partnership with other funding agencies such as the Technology Strategy Board, the UK Higher Education Funding Councils, businesses, government, and other charitable organizations. There has recently been a lot of discussion on their OA policy and the revision to that policy that took place earlier this year. The revised policy states that any research published after April 1st, 2013, that is wholly or partially funded by RCUK, must be published in gold or green OA. It also must include details on the funding that supported the research and must include information on how to access the underlying research materials, such as data, samples, or models. We will get into a little more detail about compliance with OA mandates when we talk about repositories later. A small amount of research funding comes from charitable organizations, usually with the goal of improving quality of life, so curing diseases, environmental conservation, or preserving cultural heritage. Examples are the Gates Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, or Welcome Trust. Most of us do not have time to research every single funding agency. A couple of resources that can help you quickly find more information on funding sources. The first one is FundRef. FundRef provides a standard way to report funding sources for published articles. Publishers collect the funder and grant number from the author and then send that information to CrossRef as a part of their regular metadata deposits. FundRef search then allows anyone to search a specific funder and see which articles were supported by that funder. Another good resource for funding agency information is Sherpa. Sherpa stands for securing a hybrid environment for research preservation and access. It's a partnership based out of the University of Nottingham dedicated to facilitating the rapid and efficient worldwide dissemination of research. One of their services is Juliet. Juliet is a database of research funders' open access policies. It provides a summary of funding agencies' grant conditions on self archiving for research publication and data. This enables users to clearly see what, when, and where materials are to be archived, as well as compare different policies of funding agencies. So now that an article has been written, the funding sources have been reviewed, and hopefully the article has been accepted for publication, it's time to review the publisher's copyright terms. Mary will walk you through a few best practices on what should be included in those terms. Thank you, Nicole. As you know, the copyright holder controls the work. 
where it's published, how it's used, and any future decisions the copyright holder controls. This includes any future reproduction, modification, or distribution. So I want to discuss how it's determined who will hold the copyright for any written work. This can be determined by what type of author you are, the lead author, the contributing author, or an author that is hired to create the work, and also what type of agreement or waiver a publisher, funder, or an institution has you sign. But before we can really discuss who will retain the copyright of the work, I want to quickly go over intellectual property. The intellectual property definition states that you own the words you put on the paper, and those words are your intellectual property. As an author, you decide to keep those rights or transfer some or all of the rights to a publisher for publication. Authors generally transfer any rights through a copyright transfer form. The copyright transfer agreement identifies who holds the rights to the article or the work. It is, it is important for a publisher to use, impose, collect, and store all copyright transfer agreements. When an article is accepted, the publisher will send a copyright transfer form to the author for review. The author reviews the copyright transfer form and will make the decision to sign the waiver as is, granting full rights to the publisher, or the author will reject the waiver and decide to publish at, publish at a journal that has a more liberal copyright transfer terms, or will send an amendment back to the publisher. With each of these decisions, the funding source stipulation should be considered before the author signs and sends the waiver back to the publisher. And because this is a binding agreement, an author could print, sign, and mail the version or scan a signed version of the document. And according to the Handbook of Journal Publishing, a growing number of publishers now accept an electronically signed version of the form that may be available through the peer review system. Using this functionality in the peer review system, this allows the publisher to track and store all signed copyright forms. So I would like to review some of the main types of copyright transfers used today in scholarly publishing. It is best practice that publishers require all authors to sign a copyright waiver to publish in their journal. The waiver should identify what can be done with the article or, or work after publication. Even if the form does not transfer the rights to a publisher from the author, there should still be a signed form. For example, CLOS allows authors to publish in their journal as open access with the author retaining the rights to the work. CLOS requires all authors to sign a license stating that the authors retain their rights to their works. This way, if someone wants to reuse the work, the requester will know who to obtain permission from and what they can and cannot do with the work. And I've identified three common models used. There's the copyright transfer, where the author gives or waives the rights to the work to the publisher. Then there's the license to publish, where the author retains the rights to the work and grants the publisher the right to the pub publish their work. And last, the hybrid, where the publisher and the author share the rights to the work as stated in the copyright waiver. So I'd like to take a, a closer look at a, those three models. With a traditional copyright waiver, the author gives the publisher the right to the work. The author has archiving rights to the work, or the publisher, excuse me, the publisher has archiving rights to the work, and the publisher has all future distribution, reuse, or monetary decision. Those are made by the publisher. This is and has been the standard for scholarly journals for some time. But with the edict of OSTP, publishers, authors, and institutions are now updating their copyright transfers to align with the standards set forth by funding agencies. Then with the license to publish agreement, the author retains the right to the work, but provides the publisher the license to publish the work. The author makes all decisions regarding archiving, and all future distribution, reuse, or monetary decisions are made by the author. And as I talked about earlier, the FOSS journals fall under this model. They require the author to sign the license that FOSS has the right to publish the work, but the work belongs to the author after publication. And then the last agreement is the hybrid agreement between the publisher and the author. The publisher and the author will negotiate new terms to the publisher's copyright transfer agreement. With this agreement, the author sends the publisher some amended language, and the publisher and the author can negotiate terms before the agreement is signed. 
So I've listed some of the terms that authors can potentially ask to have added to the agreement, and the publisher can allow or reject the terms based on their publishing model. The publisher retains the rights to the work but allows the author to prepare derivative works, or the publisher allows the author to reproduce, distribute, and publicly display the work, and the publisher allows the author non-commercial use of the work as long as the proper attribution is placed on the work, and then finally, the author is allowed to archive the work in a repository. This clause is usually requested by the funder to ensure they have access to the work they commissioned through a grant, government funding, or institutional funding. With every agreement, whichever agreement is used, there are terms that need to be addressed and answered if you are the publisher or the author. So some of them are, will the publisher have the rights to redistribute the work? Or will the publisher have the rights to sub-license the work, for example, with translations, permissions, or even aggregations? And then will the author have the right to self-archive in a repository? And will the author be able to reuse the work? So now that we've discussed who will hold the copyright to an article, it's important to review the license you have in place. I will, review, I will review some standard license terms and some resources to help you build the license. So as a publisher, the terms you place in your content license are important to help institutions, authors, and end users understand what can and cannot be done with any content published on your journal site. So I've outlined some of the main terms that you need to communicate with users, what's acceptable, what's acceptable use, and what's not allowed. The first item that needs to be identified or defined is what material is licensed on the site. So basically, the licensed material is the book, journal, article, or supplemental material accessed via the digital site. Next, the authorized user refers to the users who are allowed to use the material. In the case of an institution, this would refer to all students, faculty, and employees who are on the network of the institution. And a lot of publishers will use the term reasonable amount in their terms and conditions. Reasonable amount is generally no more than 10% of the content in the licensed material. Interlibrary Loan, or ILL, is a service which one library can, library can borrow books, documents, or journals from another library. ILL policies vary from library to library regarding the amount of times a work can be borrowed. A good resource to use when developing your ILL policies is to follow the CONTU guidelines. CONTU is a coalition for network information policies and is a compilation of position statements, principles, statutes, and other pertinent statements with regards to ILL. The CONTU guidelines were developed to assist librarians and copyright proprietors in understanding the amount of photocopying for use in interlibrary loan arrangements permitted under copyright law. The CONTU guidelines refer to the rule of five for works less than five years old. Remember, these are just guidelines to follow, and you have the freedom to strengthen or weaken your policy regarding ILL. For copy and borrowing beyond the five, an institution must contact the copyright holder and gain permission for reuse of the article. Perpetual access is the ability for an institution to have access to digital content perpetually. Before there were digital versions of journals or books, when an institution purchased a copy of the book or subscribed to a journal, the institution retained a copy of the book. They kept it in a stack. But with the inception of the digital age, an institution only has access for the subscribed period of time. And when they drop the subscription, they no longer have access to the digital content. With perpetual access, the institution doesn't necessarily keep a copy in the digital repository. It's up to the publisher of the work to create a space that the institution can access perpetually. So in your terms and condition, you need to clearly state if you have the ability to allow or offer perpetual access to institutions. By offering perpetual access, you are stating that no matter what, that content will be available to users with no interruption even after the institution is no, long, no longer subscribed to the journal. And then most institutions allow subscribers remote access to content by authorized users. 
these users are individuals associated with the university that have access via IP or can VPN into the network. A walk-in is generally someone not associated with the institution that will come into the library to access the content. This does not allow for remote access for people who are not associated with the institution. And course packets are the compilation of materials from various sources that can be used to teach students. You will need to define if you will or will not allow an institution to create course packets for faculty and students. If you plan to allow the use of course packets, you will need to add perimeter, parameters to your license. For example, will you allow full use with a fee or will you allow a user to use a reasonable amount of the work? Whatever you decide, make sure you quantify the amount. And commercial use allows a user to sell and resell the licensed material. Most licenses don't allow for commercial use without the required permission, payment, or attribution. And then the last term is archiving. So archiving of content is a bit different than perpetual access. When you allow an institution to archive content, it doesn't automatically mean that you will have access to the material. Most archives are not accessible to end users. So now that you've created your license for digital content, I'm going to explore the resources that can be used not as a license, but to complement or be used alongside your terms and conditions. <clears throat> the first resource is Sherpa Romeo. Because there are so many different ways that the publisher allows institutions to archive material, here's a database that institutions go to when they have questions regarding self-archiving policies, publisher by publisher. That database is Romeo. Romeo is another database housed by Sherpa at the University of Nottingham. Romeo uses four colors, green, blue, yellow, and white, and Romeo reviews the stated archiving terms on a publisher site and then places the journals into the color categories. So, as a re so to review the color categories, for green, an institution can archive, preprint, and postprint. For blue, an institution can archive the postprint. Yellow, an institution can archive a preprint. And white, archiving is not formally supported by the publisher. The next resource is CRU, or Shared Electronic Resource Understanding. CRU is an alternative used to a formal license that includes terms and conditions or terms of use. CRU was developed by the National Information Standards Association Organization, or NISO. CRU is not a license, but it is used as a companion piece to U.S. copyright law. CRU is typically used when the publisher feels comfortable relying on U.S. copyright law as governing law. CRU uses broad terms and common language to apply to many of the terms I spoke about earlier. However, if a publisher is not comfortable solely relying on, you, on the statement of U.S. copyright and feels the terms of use need to de be defined, that's when the publisher needs to have their terms attached to the site that provides the content. A few things you should decide before saying, stating you comply with CRU is if the publisher does not allow for course packets to be created for any reason, then you would not use or claim CRU on your journal site. If you don't allow ILL borrowing, you would not use CRU, and that is the same with remote access. Some publishers feel very comfortable using CRU as their companion piece, but others would like to more clearly define the parameters for use for their content. And the last companion piece to your license I want to discuss is Creative Commons. There's a lot of talk about Creative Commons, and Creative Commons provides the tools to, pub to publishers and authors alike that clearly states who has the right to the copyrighted work and how the users can use the work after it's published. Creative, Com Creative Commons licenses are not an alternative to copyright. The licenses work along copyright and enable you to modify your copyright terms to best suit your needs. Creative Commons has six licenses that they offer for use. The most liberal or relaxed license is CC BY, to the most restrictive or protective license, CC BY, ND, and C. And it's important to note that while CC stands for Creative Commons and NC stands for non-commercial, BY or BY 
represents attribution to the author or the byline of the work. Now I'm going to quickly review those licenses. The first license is CC BY Attribution. The author retains the copyright and the works can be reused, reused with attribution. As I talked about earlier, Klaus uses this license in its publishing model. It allows authors the flexibility of reusing the content and archiving the article in any repository the funding agency requires them to. The next license is CC BY SA or Attribution Share Alike, where works can be reused with attribution and works can be revised and changed with attribution. All new works based on the authors will carry the same license, so any derivatives will also allow for commercial use. And this license is used by Wikipedia. The next one is CC BY ND, so attribution with no derivatives, allows for redistribution, but the work cannot be changed in any way. This license allows for redistribution, commercial and non-commercial, as long as it's passed along unchanged and in whole with credit to you. And this license is least used in the scholarly publishing. The next license is CC BY NC, so attribution, non-commercial. And this license lets others remix, tweak, and build upon your work non-commercially. And although the new work needs must also acknowledge the author and be non-commercial, they don't have to license their derivative works on the same terms. Flipper uses this license, but it also uses the next license I'm going to talk about. And that license is CC BY and CSA, Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike. And with this, with this license, the work can be reused, but it needs attribution, it can't be used commercially, and it can be redistributed. And as I said, Flickr also uses this license, but the content in Biodiversity Heritage Library uses this content as this license as well. And the last license is CC BY NC ND, Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives. This license is the most restrictive of the Creative Commons six main licenses only allowing others to download works and share them with others as long as they credit the author, that they can't change them in any way or that, and they cannot use them commercially. This license is most commonly used with traditional scholarly publishing, and we use it when we publish our Front Matter newsletter. So if you decide to use one of the Creative Commons licenses and you're not sure what license to use, Creative Commons does have a tool on their website that publishers can use when choosing a Creative Commons license. So now that I've reviewed copyright, copyright transfers, and licenses, Nicole is going to discuss repositories. Repositories are a way to archive and sometimes give access to research. One well-known repository is PubMed Central or PMC. PMC is a free, full-text archive of biomedical and life sciences journal literature at the NIH's National Library of Medicine. NIH mandates all government-funded research must be deposited in PMC 12 months after publication. As I mentioned earlier, the OSTP memo mandates that federal agencies with over $100 million in annual expenditures must increase public access to research. These federal agencies were required to submit a proposal for how they plan to comply with this mandate. The federal agency proposals have been submitted, but not yet made public as they are still in draft form. However, three other responses have been proposed and made public. One of those three is to expand PMC beyond NIH to all agencies. PMC would charge each agency a setup fee, and there would also be a $75 fee per manuscript. Another proposed response is CORUS. CORUS stands for Clearinghouse for the Open Research of the United States. CORUS is a not-for-profit public-private partnership aimed at providing a full solution to OSTP. It builds on publishers' existing infrastructure, avoids duplication, and minimizes costs to the government. So users would be able to browse, search, read, and download full-text articles at no charge to the user and no additional cost to taxpayers. It does this by integrating identification through article metadata, 
delivery on publisher platforms and archiving systems such as Portico or Flux. Article metadata would be compiled from Crossref, Fundref, which we talked a little bit about earlier, ORCID, an author unique identifier system, and Prospects, Crossref's pilot project for text and data mining or TDM. Course was designed with the understanding that one size does not fit all. Stakeholders such as funding agencies, institutions, and nonprofits may build or already use tools, portals, and dashboards for discovery. Chorus will integrate with those as well. For example, some agencies may use PNC or develop their own portals, such as the Department of Energy's prototype PAGES, which stands for Public Access Gateway for Energy and Science. Chorus was also recently incorporated as CORE, so just C-H-O-R. That was done with the idea that down the road they may expand to be an international provider. The third proposed response was SHARE. SHARE stands for Shared Access Research Ecosystem. The ARL, AAU, and APLU propose SHARE. It's a system of cross-institutional digital repositories where each institution manages its own content, but searching can be conducted across all participating repositories. They accomplish this by adopting a common brief set of metadata requirements and allowing search engines and discovery tools to use that metadata to create a federated consensus-based system of existing university-based digital repositories. So any repository such as a discipline-based repository or a PMC could be included by simply adopting that same metadata fields and practices to become a linked node. The minimum metadata that would need to be included is the author, article title, journal title, abstract, award number, principal investigator ID, so an ORCID or an ISNI, and a designated repository number. SHARE would also require information on copyright license and preservation rights. So if any organization didn't already have its own digital repository, it would be able to de designate an existing repository to hold their research. SHARE and course leaders recently met in August and planned to work together for each of these system and systems to complement each other. SHARE leaders also recently met with NSF representatives, and they left it up to the White House whether or not they want to meet to discuss the proposal further. Either way, SHARE plans to move ahead because the institutions themselves are increasingly finding that demand to have access to repository at this level for research. One example of this emergence is consortia repositories, which we will talk a little bit more about in just a minute. Before we move on to consortia repositories, let's talk a little bit about current trends in institutional repositories. To illustrate these trends, I will go through four repositories as examples. Since Allen Press is located in Lawrence, Kansas, the home of the Jayhawks, and I am a Jayhawk myself, we'll start with the University of Kansas. In 2009, KU became the first public university in the U.S. to adopt a faculty-initiated open access policy for research published in peer-reviewed journals. The KU Faculty Senate passed a revised OA policy on February 11, 2010. Their digital repository called KU ScholarWorks contains work by faculty and staff as well as material from their university archives. They organize this content by what they call communities. Communities correspond to academic departments, research centers, or other organizational units. Each community creates its own guidelines and policies for deposit of content. While it's strongly recommended for items in the repository to be open access, items can be deposited with an embargo period or restricted to groups of registered users at the item, collection, or community level with the approval of the community's administrator. For faculty to verify permission deposit, KU refers them to the publisher's copyright transfer form or Sherpa Romeo, or they'll provide templates for faculty to contact publishers for permission directly. At the faculty's discretion, they may waive the license granted to KU regarding an individual article by written or electronic notification to the provost designate and submit only the bibliographic information within 30 days of publication. KU also created a two-year pilot OA fund designed to support authors who publish in open access journals. The fund covers the cost of article processing fees up to $2,000. The burden of funding OA is sometimes shifted to the author, and we're seeing a trend of institutions establishing OA funds like KU to help alleviate that burden for faculty. 
The next example I'd like to talk about is the University of California. Their digital repository is called eScholarship. Their Academic Senate passed an OA policy on July 24, 2013. It grants license to the University of California prior to any contractual agreement with a publisher. Faculty from UC Irvine, UCLA, and UCSF are depositing articles with a publication agreement signed after July 24. The deposit of articles for the remaining UC campuses is expected to begin in fall 2014. Faculty can opt out of the policy just like KU on a per article basis permanently or for an embargo period. Faculty at UCSF are still required to deposit for archival purposes but the other campuses are not required to deposit if they decide to opt out. Some UC campuses have also started OA funds similar to the KU OA fund pilot. The next example is MIT. MIT's repository is called DSpace at MIT. It includes conference papers, images, peer-reviewed scholarly articles, preprints, technical reports, thesis, working papers, research data sets, and more. On average, the repository sees more than 1 million downloads per month. The MIT OA policy was adopted by faculty unanimous vote on March 18, 2009. This policy does not apply to articles, however, completed before the policy was adopted. So just like KU and UC, authors are allowed to opt out by filling out a simple web form or sending an email informing MIT. And last, I'd like to talk about archives. This is a subject-based repository hosted by Cornell University. It contains over 800,000 e-prints in physics, math, computer science, quantitative biology, quantitative finance, and statistics. You must be a registered user to deposit, but you only need to provide your identity and affiliated institution in order to register, and anyone can access the e-prints. It's important to remember the content in institutional repositories is licensed to that institution. The copyright still remains with the copyright holder. Next, I'd like to review consortia repositories. Along with all of their other resources, some academic consortia are also sharing their repositories. The first example of this is OhioLink. OhioLink is a consortium of 89 Ohio College and University Libraries plus the State Library of Ohio. They provide consortium members access to the Digital Resource Commons, or DRC. DRC provides hosting, operational, and development services for individual institutions to develop their own repository. DRC provides a statewide platform for saving, discovering, and sharing free of charge the instructional, research, historic, and creative materials produced by the University System of Ohio, Ohio Independent Colleges, and of particular note, Ohio Cultural Institutions. So while with most court consortia, we're seeing that they work with colleges and universities and academic institutions, OhioLink also includes cultural institutions. Another example is Carly. Carly stands for the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Illinois. It's a consortia of 145 member libraries committed to meeting the information and research needs of their 850,000 students and thousands of faculty and staff. They use the institutional repository platform Digital Commons. Carly includes research and scholarship from Digital Commons repositories of other Carly members. Carly institutional repositories that are not hosted with the Digital Commons platform are available through provided links, but these materials will not be included in Carly's search results. These are just a few examples. So how do you find out more information on repositories? One resource is OpenDoor. OpenDoor is a directory of academic open access repositories. It allows you to browse the directory, search for specific repositories, or search repository content. Each repository is reviewed by project staff to ensure that the listing is accurate. They also provide tools and support to both repository administrators and service providers in sharing best practices and improving the quality of the repository infrastructure. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Mary. Thank you, Nicole. Now that we've taken you through the path of an article, I want to conclude some main points with I want to conclude with some main points that we would like you to take away from managing authorship and copyright agreements. The first is 
to become familiar with the different funding sources and what their requirements for publication are, and to understand the importance of the copyright waiver as it pertains to how your work is used after publication and who owns the work. Then to identify and define what needs to be in your content license and what resources can be used when setting up your terms. And lastly, repositories are growing and it's important to know what the options are for depositing and access. And before I hand it back to Joanna, here are, some few here are a few additional resources for you. Great, thank you ladies. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in, in during the presentation, um, so we'll start out with those. Uh, and if you have questions while we're going, please feel free to continue to chat those into me and I'll try to get them as well. Um, so the first question we had was actually about um, publishing a book, and uh, this person wanted to know if they're, if they're publishing a book that's currently in the public domain, uh, what information should they put on the copyright page? And currently, I think what they're doing is uh, giving the orig original copyright holder um, and then also adding reprinted by X publisher, and just wanted to know if that seems like a good practice. So if it's in the publishing domain, you would need to look at their license to see what they are asking for. So if they're asking or telling you that it's okay to um, you know, redistribute this or, or put it someplace else, as long as there's attribution and no changes, then that should be enough. But I would review their license to, under, to know what to put on your site. Okay, so um, we also always have folks ask, um, you know, if the notes are going to be made available after the fact, and of course we will post um, video and the slides from today's presentation, so you'll have those available to you um, so that you can have things like uh, Mary's great resources slide here. Um, so another question is um, about, you know, your copyright policy, and is it common for authors to request modifications to a publisher's stated copyright policy? Um, for example, maybe to comply with a, a funder's mandate, um, and, and if so, are publishers typically flexible about that, or do they like to stick to their guns? So it's becoming more and more of a common practice, with the, especially with the new mandates and OSTP, that institutions and funding agencies are asking for accommodations to, make, to be made with publisher, publishers' licenses. Um, some publishers are very flexible, the others are not. It just really kind of depends on what the model is. Okay. So um, is it common for publishers to put their copyright and disclosure forms online? Um, or are those always in print? What's the trend that we're seeing now? Yes, we're seeing that um, typically they're putting their um, terms online um, somewhere on the website, either with each article or maybe in the footer of that website so that it's visible and easily accessible for everyone. Right, and I think as Mary addressed early on, we're also seeing a trend in people um, actually managing that process electronically, you know, accepting a, an electronic copyright form rather than requesting or requiring that all of that be in, in printed format and actually keeping the piece of paper around too. So the next question, um, what advice or considerations can you share for journals that have existing content that they want to repurpose, um, for example, for renaming or relaunch of the journal? So if it's material that you own, um, you know, and you want to just make derivative works, and the author is not involved, you should be able to um, repurpose and reuse the work. If, you know, there's an agreement with the author that they own the rights, but you have the right to publish it, you would need to work with the author to um, and find out if that's acceptable for them because they control that. Right, so ultimately, ultimately it depends on who um, owned the copyright in the first place. A lot of times I think we're seeing for older content, you know, it's very common for the publisher to own the copyright. That's maybe not the case in the last 
um, five or six years. So it's definitely going to be important to take a look at that, at what the copyright is on that actual work. And, and to look at the copyright agreements that were signed at the time of publication. Right. So um, how long do you recommend that a copyright release form should be saved? So typically copyright stays um, in act or stays active for 75 years. Um, and I would keep it, you know, as long as that and, you know, hold on to them for any future reference. Yeah. Um, so the, we've got a couple of questions about um, people accepting electronic copyright. Um, you know, is are the electronic files okay to save? How are publishers deciding whether or not um, they would accept electronically signed copyright forms? Um, I think some of it has to do with, you know, where the author is. Do they have access to um, send them in electronically? There are some authors in developing nations that don't have that that access and will still mail them. But, you know, there are peer review systems that have that functionality um, and can just store them for you with an electronic or, uh, signature. I think what we've really seen with a lot of publications is, um, you know, sometimes people have to get with their legal department and, and decide um, what's appropriate for your publication. It, it may be dependent somewhat on the subject matter, it may be dependent somewhat on, on the tradition of your publication, and, you know, it's not sort of a one-size-fits-all. So I would always recommend in a, in a case where you're concerned about whether it might be appropriate for your publication to go ahead and talk with a, a lawyer about it and see, um, you know, what they would say. Um, and one last question, with consortia repositories, um, Nicole, can you explain a little bit about how the licensing works? Does a publisher license the content to an individual institution that happens to belong to the consortia, or do they do license directly to the consortia? Um, it works both ways. Sometimes you will, uh, a consortia will contact a publisher directly. Um, other times there's one library that already has a license to that contact content and, you know, will either contact the publisher after the fact to make sure that it's okay for that to be a part of consortia, or when they're working out that agreement with the publisher in the beginning, they will let them know that they are a part of consortia and this content will be shared among those academic institutions. Okay, great. Uh, looks like that's all of the questions that we have for today. So I want to thank Mary and, and Nicole, as well as um, everyone who attended today's webinar. I do hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that you gained a deeper understanding of the intricacies of authorship, copyright, and licensing as they relate to your publication. We will be sending out a brief survey that will include links to both the slides and a video recording of today's session. Please do take a few moments to complete the survey. Uh, we are always looking for feedback on how we can improve future webinars and suggestions for future topics. Um, since this is the final webinar in our 2013 series, um, believe it or not, we'll start brainstorming for topics for next year pretty soon, so we would really appreciate any ideas that you might have some things that you'd like to see us cover um, in 2014. And don't forget, you can always continue the conversation on both Facebook and Twitter. That concludes our session for today. Thanks very much for attending.